It is always harder to do the right thing. When you walk over that bridge and those classrooms come into view, it's like home. When you set out a project like this and we had a blank slate and we were able to all sit down and do a what if we could. I was part of the design process. I saw what went into it. We had conversations about how this building would live on the land and how it would become part of the landscape. And as a result of this building being designed in that way, we can teach a whole habitat lesson here and see different parts of that habitat. We wanted to demonstrate that you can do this because a lot of environmental backlash that you get about it, regulations is it's difficult. You can't afford it, we can't do it. it, just doesn't work here. And so for us to set out to design this project to prove that you can do it, it is beautiful and it can be cost effective. This is exactly what we wanted to be nationally recognized as an example of building in harmony with the environment. And the Code Award says we succeeded. The American Institute of Architects Committee on the Environment Top 10 Awards is the industry's best known awards program for sustainable design. In 2020, the University of Southern Mississippi's Marine Education Center won this award. The award isn't just given for energy efficiency, but considers the architectural experience, the project's beauty, and its function. Each year, 10 winners have been recognized for environmental performance linked with design quality. The Marine Education Center is the first project in Mississippi to receive this award. Submissions for AIA Coke Top 10 Award are judged using 10 different criteria, including designing for energy, wellness, resources, and design for change. Or in other words, how does the project design anticipate adapting to new uses, adapting to climate change, and supporting resilient recovery from disasters. I have a very vivid memory of three days after Katrina standing underneath the tattered remains of the building and having someone say how long it would take us to build it back here. And my initial thought was, really? <laughs> you want to do this again? But that was the primary push for the first three years. It persisted for over a year in planning before the idea was ultimately rejected. The vision that Chris had for this building was so different from the norm in terms of being something that could move forward as part of the environment and being resilient to storms. We pushed every envelope as far as we could. How can we build this building cutting down the minimal amount of trees? How can we build this building without clear cutting and leveling and then rebuilding? How can we build around the natural flow of the land? We must first listen to the land in order to create a resilient building. By doing that, you do not create structures that impose themselves on the landscape, but that respond in nature and harmony with I loved being at Halstead where you just walked out the door and the sound was there. But I have come to love Little Tahiti because that's what I call it. It's like if you were on an island and you were coming up from the beach, coming through the little mangroves into the spot where the community was. Everything is like in its perfect spot. It's like it was here all along. And I know it wasn't, but it's just got that feel to it. My first reaction when I saw this was, yeah, now I see what they were talking about. Now I see why they were so excited about this for so long, because this is legitimately the most impressive facility, the best designed, most well-integrated facility of this type that I've ever been around. We wanted this facility to be somewhere where you had to move through the outdoors as part of the experience here. We wanted to put the students outside as much as we possibly could in nature. Students inherently know that they're doing something different here when they're outdoors, and they get it. It's very open, but it's very well contained. So the children have freedom, but we don't have to worry about them so much. And they love it, it's very calming. Students are involved in the kinds of activities that scientists are doing. It puts the kids in an active role, and active learning is well documented as a way of increasing the impact of learning on students. That's really the pleasure of my job, is that I get to engage people, students, members of the public, and teachers in active learning. 
The MEC is a space for the larger community to come in and talk to our researchers, talk to our scientists, and understand what we do, why we do it, and why that has meaning and value to them. It also really ties into the changes that we're making at USM and SOSC, and it really fits in with the fact that USM is in the process of undergoing this transition to a much larger, much more research active R1 institution. The fact that we have this now award-winning facility is only going to make it more effective for the community to understand what we do and why it's valuable and help them to understand that they need to support the mission of USM and SOSC. What I'd like for people to know is that it's here. There were so many people who were devastated when the Marine Education Center and Aquarium was destroyed during Hurricane Katrina. And the Marine Education Center is back. It looks very different from the way it looked in Biloxi because we built back to be resilient. And it's still doing the same things that use place-based learning. We're still teaching kids in ways that they can really learn about the ocean. The one thing for parents to know when they send their kids here is that they're gonna have a life-altering experience. The staff goes above and beyond here, making sure that that student learns the most they can because they know in the end that that student is gonna go out in this world. Anyone can do this anywhere, anytime. Any building can be efficient, any building can be low impact, and any building can enhance the environment rather than harming the